My name is John Passfield, and I'm going to read from my novel, John Passfield, Saturday Morning. The title of this reading will be Saturday Morning, Video 8, The News as Imagery 2, The News of the World. So here's the cover. John Passfield, Saturday Morning, my future wife and I on our little Lost and Haley Sprite at the time. This is 1967. The car was a 1960 Lost and Haley Sprite. A novel by John Passfield. So top John Passfield, the main character at 21 years old. The bottom John Passfield is the author uh, who wrote the novel a year or so ago and I'm 76 as I uh, read from the novel. Oh, the back summary, I almost forgot. Let me read that. A 21-year-old would-be writer, John Passfield, spends his last few months as a garbage collector on the streets of his hometown, St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada, in the summer of Canada's centennial year, 1967. As he works, he compares the imagery of his own life so far and of his upcoming marriage and pending career as a high school teacher to the imagery of the great books that he's reading, all in the pursuit of building the perfect load of garbage in the back of this open truck. Well, the novel takes place in July 1967, five days after a major news event, the centennial of Canada, the main character's home country. In planning the novel of his thoughts, I decided that a layer of imagery in the mind of the main character would be the world news of the decade of the 1960s. I chose three news stories from that time, the death of President John F. Kennedy, the race to put a person on the moon, and the Vietnam War. Now this novel could be thought as a history novel, it could be thought of nostalgia of what happened to my generation, but I would hope people reading it ask themselves, well what are the world events that have happened in their generation, in a reader's generation? Now it's the pandemic right now, this is 2021, and so COVID-19, this world pandemic, has been with us for about two years. So everybody in the world is experiencing that, and these world events affect us. They become imagery in our minds and kind of change the way maybe we would have thought about life had these things not happened. They might make us more optimistic. They might make us more pessimistic, but they certainly affect us. So what are the world events that have influenced your generation, you who are perhaps the reader of this novel or the person who's listening to this video? Although the three news reports interlayer with one another and with other imagery as the novel is printed, uh, as it interlayers in the mind of the main character, I will read each of these news reports, which are information remembered as imagery in chronological order. So the first one I chose was a really major event uh, for my generation, for all the people alive at that time. And so I'll go to page 13 here. I'll just have to search for page numbers occasionally uh, because it's, they're spread out throughout the novel. And the point there, of course, is that... Uh, they're interlayering with other events to, in order to make imagery. If you put two events side by side and you ask what the connection is, right away you're into imagery. Imagery requires interpretation. Here's the first one. The president's body is being flown from Dallas to Washington. A state funeral is being arranged as we speak. There will be a lying in state at the Capitol Dome. So that's one image I made about 55 in a chapter but a very powerful image for the people who lived through that experience. Next installment, we go to page 31. So leaving out many, many pages of imagery as well, all of which uh, are impinging on this image. The president's widow, as you can see, is leaving the plane. You can see that her clothing has a number of dark stains. Needless to say, these stains were caused by the president's blood. Then we go to page 48, so from 31 to 48, think of how many images are being left out by this reading, but are being influenced by this imagery, and are influencing this imagery in turn in the mind of the main character. The riderless horse is a time-honored symbol of the soldier who has fallen in the midst of the action. The president's widow stands with her children as a catafalque passes by. Young John John gives his father a final salute. Uh, from uh, 48, we go to 67. There we are. 
It was a dull day here in Washington as we witnessed this somber November event. One can't help thinking as the catafalque passes by of the ebullience, the optimism, a sense of life having a creative purpose as the president took office such a short time ago. So the youngest president ever elected, leader of the free world at that time, there was a, an uplift, I think, in everybody's feelings. You know, we, we can make a better world. We, we the generations previous to, to mine, had uh, fought the Second World War and the First World War previous to that. But the feeling was, well, we'll create a new world, a better world, a different world, you know. And then, of course, that particular president was shot. Well, it affects you. It affects your whole generation. I'm saying that other things in other generations have powerful effects, too. Let's go from that page, 67 to 84. Here we are. Of course, we all remember the president's press conferences. He always seemed so sure of himself and in command, always ready with a shrewd comment or a witty phrase. So, the man who is in control of life, it seems, and then look what can happen. Look what can happen to anybody. Okay, on to 102, 103. No doubt the funeral procession will be etched in the memories of this entire generation. The lift that the president gave to people of all genders and races and creeds was perhaps a hallmark of his presidency. To see such unbridled optimism come to an end so abruptly is a shock from which it will be difficult for many to recover, to overcome. And then the last one, page 121. Internment will be at Arlington Cemetery. No need to remind everyone who is watching and listening of the President's exploits during the war on PT-109. We are told that his widow will light an eternal flame. So that's only uh, seven images in, the, in a whole novel of 16 chapters times over 50 images per chapter, but it can be very, uh, imagery can be kind of small in terms of word content, I suppose, or chemicals in the brain, but very, very powerful and very effective. Another one I chose was the uh, the race to land a person on the moon. We'd say a person now. We said a man then. That's just the way you thought in those days. I'll go to page 15. Of course, it's 1967, so it hasn't happened yet. But the thought of it, you know, the thought that, well, let's all do something positive, I guess, was what uh, we were thinking at the time. So world events that have, have an uplifting, uh, awe-inspiring uh, element to them. Uh, whoops, let me find it here. What am I looking for? Page 15. Oh, here we are. Sorry. It happened only 10 short years ago. The advent of the first artificial Earth satellite, the Russian Sputnik of 1957, gave to all humankind a new perspective on life down here on the Earth. It was a concrete indication of the tremendous, one might almost say unimaginable, size of the universe, and at the same time of the seemingly unlimited potential of the human adventure. So, a kind of shift in the way mankind thought of itself, simply because we could see ourselves this floating ball in the sky, this planet from, from outside the planet. It was astounding, really. So once in a while, a major world event that changes thinking. Okay, sorry, I got mixed up there. Uh, let's go to page 33. It was not so long ago, ladies and gentlemen, Certainly within a living lifetime, when turn-of-the-century fantasists were speculating, by, uh, speculating about the possibility of human flight within the 20th century, and wondering whether it would ever come to pass. And now, in 67 short years, from 1900 to 1967, our possibility horizons have expanded to the very realistic assumption that humankind will one day set foot on the moon. Amazing, you know, how uh, short a span, you might say, and how how far technology had taken us, and is taking us now in 2021. That's the point. It may be a history novel, but it's also a novel about right now, and will be a novel about right now and times to come. That was page 33. Let's go to page 51.
It was a warm and sunny day. President Kennedy addressed the nation and the world and spoke words of boldness, of vision, and of resolve to achieve the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon. Uh, then we go to page uh, 69. Within the past two years, 1966 and 1967, we've had a number of amazing photographs from space. We've had the first image of Earth from the moon orbit, the first image of Earth from the moon's surface, and the first full disc color pictures of the Earth. We have seen ourselves from a perspective from which humankind has never been able to see itself before. So astounding then and astounding now, eh? The picture of the Earth from outer space uh, just floating there in, well, what might be called a void. Uh, so mankind changing its view of itself, I guess, eh? Let's go to 87. There are times when reality and imagination seem to be separated by only a razor-thin membrane. To imagine a landing on the moon is now, in the summer of 1967, not an image from the world of fantasy, nor a scene from a science fiction movie. So close are we, ladies and gentlemen, that we'll we soon be able to see, before this decade is out, as President Kennedy promised, through the miracle of telecommunications, a human footprint on the moon. So the anticipation of such a major world event. Uh, 107, no, 105, sorry. Sorry, I have to hunt so much, but uh, these are spread out amid other imagery. And the whole point is that in the mind of the main character, all of these images are operating and all at the same time. I think of it as curling rocks, say. You have curling rocks inside the circle, but a new curling rock comes into the circle. And it can change the configuration of the curling rocks already there. So one image, seven images about the moon in a novel of 50,000 words can have an effect on the other images, just as that one curling rock can change all the curling rocks in terms of their significance, their value. We do not know what words will be spoken on the occasion of the first human footprints on the moon. What words could possibly rise to the level of momentousness of that soon-to-be epoch-making occasion? What words would you suggest, ladies and gentlemen, to be spoken at that awe-inspiring moment as a summary of the thoughts of all humankind? Well, I guess I'm having a little fun here because it's 1967 and the first words on the moon have not been spoken. But in 2021, I guess we're talking about landing on Mars, have landed there with mechanical devices. But what do you suggest the first human says when we land on uh, another planet? Um, that would kind of summarize uh, where we are and where we expect to go. It's an interesting thought. Uh, lastly, I guess, uh, yes, it is last, 123 of this news about the potential moon landing is this. And dare we do this? Suppose we cast our thoughts beyond the anticipated first landing on, of humankind on the moon. What is out there? What is out there far beyond the Earth and the orbiting moon, far beyond our sun and our galaxy, for humankind, adventurous, ever striving, ambitious humankind to encounter, to wonder at, and to explore. Well, this is 1967, but in 2021, there's a future, eh? Like, where are we going as a planet? Where do we hope not to go? Where do we hope that we uh, can go? as a planet. So the novel's alive in that sense. If you take the equivalent of the 1967 imagery, what's the 2021 imagery? What will be uh, imagery 50 years from now if you read this novel or 100 years from now? The last one I chose uh, of the three, the death of John F. Kennedy, the moon landing, the potential moon landing, is the Vietnam War. Page 18 uh, is the first one. I'll find it here. I wouldn't say it started optimistically, um, but I would say that something went terribly wrong. So 
we have these generational world events that uh, are not necessarily positive at any time, but that seem to get worse, you know. So let's hope the future as of 2021 has more of the, the positive world events and fewer of the negative. You can see from this helicopter shot the defoliant being sprayed onto the trees. It is called Agent Orange and enables the surveillance crews to observe the enemy movements on the ground. What looks like ants down there are the Vietnamese peasants gathering their families on whatever they can carry and running away. Well, that becomes the norm, eh? It becomes the television news. It becomes the way life is being lived on a world scale. Sadly, I would say, as uh, most people would say. Here's another uh, element of the news. The internal politics on the Allied side of this war in Vietnam have taken many twists and turns. It is to be hoped that a much more stable government for a democratic Vietnam is now in place. If so, it can mean a much more vigorous and productive conduct of the war. So, our leaders uh, living in a bubble, I suppose. Let's go to page 54 here. I'll pause in my talking, but, you know, um, living in a bubble, pursuing this war, and figuring everything's going to turn out for the best. Here's another episode in the, the news about the Vietnam War. Behind me, the soldiers are setting fire to the huts of some of the Vietnamese peasants. They are thought to be Vietnamese who are sympathetic to the northern side. A soldier reported the possibility that gunfire might have originated from the direction of these huts. Well, I chose my language carefully. I made this up, but from remembered newscasts. Um, thought to be. Um, reported the possibility might have originated. You know, they're destroying these people's homes all because maybe they're sympathetic to the other side, you know. These are world events that go so sour. Um, and who knows how it happens, you know. Can we get control of the world for the better, for positive results? Well, here's some history. What have we learned from that? We see here the soldiers wading through the rice paddies under cover of friendly fire. It can be very confusing to attempt to mount an offensive in a landscape that is so different from that at home. It's amazing that the spirit and resolve of the soldiers has remained so high. So that's the news. Um, how uh, high is the spirit and resolve of the soldiers? I wonder. Sorry, just looking for the next one here. The official report on the progress of the war in Vietnam is very positive. It admits that there have been setbacks, but it points out the many localized incidents that indicate that progress is being made. It also points out, however, that the public here at home should steal the resolve to the waging of a very difficult and protracted war. Well, the news recently seemed to be that the war in Afghanistan, 2001 to 2021, had come to an end. So I don't know what we, we as a world, learned uh, about the Vietnam War that applied uh, positively to uh, future wars. Uh, 107. Ah, uh, here we go. Just a couple more reports on the Vietnam War. Behind me here, some peasants are being questioned as to what they know of the movements of the enemy in this area. Of course, not all of the peasants are convinced that a democratic government of Vietnam will provide a better life for them after the war. The difficulty for the interrogators is in determining just how reliable is the information that these inscrutable non-combatants tends to provide. So when you start thinking of other people as inscrutable non-combatants, um, Something is happening, you know, to the sensibility of a, of a whole world, eh? A whole nation and a whole world. 126 is the final one that I wrote. Our coverage of the Vietnam War will continue in a moment. We will pause now to take a commercial break, after which we will bring you the latest body count. So, fascinating to think that even uh, body count can become 
routine on the nightly news, wedged in among the commercials and the sports scores and so on, you know. Uh, there's an attempt, I think, in every generation, certainly in, in the time now, 2021, to take control of the world for the better. You know, and I hope my novel isn't pessimistic, but I think it's just looking at some of the things that have happened in the past as potential imagery for the future, both positive and negative. You know, we can only look at the future, I suppose, by examining the past and present and saying, well, will it be like this or like that? How much control will we have to make it not be like the negative, be like the positive? Anyway, here's a note that I wrote. We live our lives, our action lives, and our thought lives in the local world of our families, the towns in which we live, and the societies of our home countries. Most of the information which we turn into speculative imagery is from these sources, which one would call local or immediate sources of experience. There's plenty of this image category in the novel, but we also live our thought lives in the context of the big world which surrounds us and which comes to us as news. The news becomes personal when we suffer a world disaster, such as COVID-19 right now in 2021, or are called away from home to fight a faraway war. I'm living through the COVID-19 world pandemic now as I read this novel in 2021. In 1967, the Vietnam War was my war. I was in my teen years and 20s while it was being fought, but being a Canadian, I was not called upon to go. Nevertheless, I was aware during that time, not only of the nearby American boys who were called upon to fight, but also of the lives of my parent and grandparent generations, who had lived through three world events, all of which changed their lives. The First World War, the Great Depression, and the Second World War. The point that this novel makes, though, is that whether we participate in world events or whether we are aware of them from a distance, the news of these events forms a layer of imagery in our minds. If this is the pattern of the recent past, what then might be the potential possibilities and denied possibilities of my life as it moves into the future and the lives of the people of my generation? We are all creatures of sensibility. World events impress and alter our sensibilities. My generation was not only formed by family, friends, towns, local societies, and countries. We were also formed by world events. The action patterns by which we shape our lives and the image patterns by which we attempt to interpret our lives are a product of an untold number of layers of imagery in our minds. This novel is an attempt to render an impression of that phenomenon, the thinking our way through our lives phenomenon in literary form. In order to be able to write of this phenomenon, I have evolved a unique form of expression, which I call the poetic novel. Well, once again, this is the novel, John Passfield, Saturday Morning, a novel by John Passfield. It's found on Amazon with more information. It's found on my publisher's website, rocksmillspress.com, all one word, more information there. If you go to my website, johnpassfield.ca, there's a planning notebook, which I wrote. It's there for free. Just click on the icon for you to read. A journal of reflection. Just what is this novel all about? What are novels all about? What is the poetic novel all about? And how do you write one, I suppose? Go to uh, my website, johnpassville.ca. Click on journals. It's there to read for free. Lastly, I'll say thank you for watching this video.